Hello, I'm Art Hunter uh, of the Canadian Association for the Club of Rome. Uh, we would like to welcome you to our 121st uh, speaker in our weekly Zoom series. Today we are pleased um, to welcome uh, Mr. Jack Gibbons, who has been chair of the Ontario Clean Air Alliance uh, since uh, 1997. Uh, this economist has over 40 years of research and advocacy with the Ontario energy and environmental issues. Uh, he's worked for the Ontario Energy Board and served as a Toronto Hydro Commissioner. Jack's presentation, Moving Ontario to a Zero Carbon Electricity Grid and <clears throat> uh, Lower Energy Bills by 2030, is a critique of Premier Doug Ford's proposed um, <clears throat> expansion of the production of, of, of power using gas turbines instead of alternate greenhouse gas um, reduction uh, uh, technology. And with that, Jack, can uh, you go ahead and, and uh, make your presentation? Okay, thank you, Art, for, for that introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jack Gibbons from the Ontario Clean Air Alliance. And as Art mentioned, we were established 25 years ago with the goal of promoting the phase out of Ontario's five dirty coal fired power plants. And we worked on that issue for every day for 17 years until the last coal plant was phased out in April 2014. And now we're working on the next step to clean up Ontario's electricity grid, namely to phase out our gas-fired power plants and to move Ontario to a, a zero carbon electricity grid by 2030. And we're also working to promote the phase out of gas for home heating by promoting uh, air source heat pumps and ground source heat pumps as an alternative to gas, gas furnaces uh, for home heating. So next slide, please. But before we talk about uh, our plan to, to phase out uh, gas for electric power generation and home heating, it's important to, to review uh, four of the key energy policies of Premier Doug Ford. First, uh, the Doug Ford government wants to increase the greenhouse gas pollution from our existing gas-fired power plants by more than 600% by 2040. And to add insult to injury, they also want to build new gas-fired power plants in Ontario. With respect to nuclear power, the Doug Ford government wants to spend almost $30 billion on high cost nuclear power projects, which will push up our electricity rates. And finally, the Doug Ford government supports Enbridge's uh, proposal to expand their, their gas distribution network to hook up more homes in rural Ontario to gas, despite the fact that heat pumps uh, can give customers bigger bill reductions and can actually reduce their greenhouse gas pollution for home heating. Next slide, please. Now this slide shows the historic and forecast greenhouse gas pollution from our electric power plants. And it goes from 2005 to 2040. The good news is that thanks to the phase out of our dirty coal plants, our, the greenhouse gas pollution from our electric power plants fell by 93% between 2005 and 2017. But since 2017, the pollution from our power plants has started to rise again. And according to the IESO or Independent Electricity System Operator, the pollution from our gas plants will increase by 375% by 2030 and by more than 600% by 2040. And if this occurs, we will lose about half of the pollution reduction benefits that we achieve by phasing out our five dirty coal-fired power plants. Next slide, please. And in addition to, to ramping up the pollution from the existing gas plants, 
Last month, the Minister of Energy directed the IESO to contract for up to another 1,500 megawatts of new gas-fired generation capacity. And these contracts are to last until 2040, despite the fact that uh, Prime Minister Trudeau has promised to move, Ontario, uh, to move Canada to a net zero carbon electricity grid by 2035. Next slide, please. Now here's a breakout of Doug Ford's proposed spending on high cost nuclear power. He wants to spend $12.8 billion rebuilding Darlington's four aging reactors. He wants to spend $13 billion rebuilding the Bruce uh, Station's aging reactors. And he wants to spend $3 billion uh, building, uh, building a new nuclear reactor in the GTA. And th this is the forecast cost, but as we know, nuclear projects go over budget, actual costs could be a lot higher. Next slide, please. And finally, the, fo the fourth key point about uh, Doug Ford's uh, energy plan is that he wants to expand uh, gas for home heating into these new gas communities in rural Ontario, despite the fact that heat pumps are lower costs financially for homeowners over their life cycle and also can actually reduce our greenhouse gas pollution. Next slide, please. Now, needless to say, the Ontario Clean Air Alliance does not support Doug Ford's plan to ramp up the use for gas for electric power generation or for home heating. So in February of 2020, we launched a campaign to promote the phase out uh, uh, of gas power, gas power, gas fired electricity uh, by 2030. And I'm very pleased to note uh, that so far 34 municipalities that represent almost 60% of Ontario's population have passed resolutions asking Premier Ford to phase out our, our gas-fired power plants. And specifically, they've asked, asked Premier Ford to return the gas plants pollution back to their 2017 level as soon as possible and to achieve a complete phase out of gas power by 2030. Next slide, please. Now we need, need to turn to the IESO or Independent Electricity System Operator. The IESO is the agency that, that keeps our lights on. And the, the chairman of the board of the IESO is Joe Oliver. You may remember that he was a minister of finance in the Stephen Harper government. And he's also a very prominent climate denier. Now, when, when Joe Oliver and the IESO started to learn that municipalities uh, were passing resolutions calling for the phase out of gas power, they were not pleased. They were not pleased at all. And so in October of last year, the IESO issued a report in, a, in an attempt to discredit uh, the, municipal, the municipalities call for a gas power phase out. And th this report, which was released a, a year ago, they made a number of claims that were that are absolutely false and irresponsible. First, they claimed that it would be impossible. It would be impossible to phase out gas power by 2030. Then they said, if we tried to do so, our electricity rates would skyrocket and we would experience rolling blackouts. And all of these claims are false and irresponsible. Next slide, please. So first, uh, let's deal with their claim that it will be impossible to phase out uh, gas power by 2030. That's what they said. But when you read their report carefully, you see that they actually outlined a plan to move Ontario to a 99.7% zero carbon electricity grid by 2030. But then they went on to make this false and absurd claim that it would not be possible um, to obtain the remaining three tenths of 1% of our electricity needs from zero carbon resources by 2030. And that claim, we all know it just can't be true. 
because if you're willing to uh, invest a bit more money in energy efficiency or wind or solar or Quebec water power, then absolutely uh, we can increase our supply of uh, carbon-free electricity resources by another three-tenths of 1%. So in fact, the IESO report demonstrated that we can achieve a, a gas power phase out by 2030. Next slide, please. This, the second type of irresponsible fear mongering that, that the ISO report engaged in is they said, you know, if we try to, to phase out gas power by 2030, we'll have blackouts. And this claim, again, absolutely false. Because in 2030, at least 33% of our existing gas fire generation capacity will still be under contract to the ISO. So if for any reason, because of an extreme event in 2030, we don't have enough zero carbon electricity resources to meet 100% of our electricity needs, what will the IES do? It will fire up the gas plants to keep the lights on. The ISO will absolutely not subject us to rolling blackouts when the blackouts could be avoided by firing up our existing gas-fired power plants that are under contract to the IESO. So again, a very political statement by the IESO and totally irresponsible. Next slide, please. And the final outrageous claim by the IESO was that, you know, attempting to phase out gas power would cause residential electricity rates to rise by 60%. Once again, when you read the report carefully, there is absolutely no evidence or analysis to justify this claim. When you read the report carefully, it actually just predicts the costs would rise by 20%, just by 20%. And the report provides no analysis or justification for their assertion that a 20% a a rise in costs would lead to a 60% rise in electricity rates for, for residential customers. Next slide, please. But here's an, another serious problem with their, with their claim that a gas power phase out would lead to, to higher electricity rates. It turns out that their claim that costs would rise by 20% is also false. There's no basis for this claim that there's no real factual basis for this claim that costs would rise by 20%. They, they made this claim by, uh, by, by making um, misleading or um, uh, uh, counterfactual assumptions. And, and there were three basic uh, misleading assumptions they made to justify their, their claim that costs would rise by 20%. The first thing they did was they underestimated the carbon tax sa uh, savings that electricity consumers would enjoy if we phased out uh, a, a gas-fired uh, power. And, and in 2030, they underestimated the carbon tax savings for electricity consumers by about $2 billion a year. So, so that's a big error. And the second, uh, uh, misleading assumption they made was by ignoring our two lowest cost storage options. Now to, to phase, out, uh, uh, phase out gas power, we have to invest in wind and solar energy. And we all know that the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. So wind and solar must be combined with a storage option. But the IESO, when they're doing their analysis, ignored Ontario's two lowest cost storage options for our wind and solar energy. First, they ignored the, the fact that Hydro-Quebec's reservoirs could be used by Ontario to act like a giant battery for our wind and solar. Second, they ignored that our electric vehicle batteries could be used to store wind and solar energy and then provide it back to the grid during peak demand hours uh, uh, to phase out gas power. So by ignoring these two lowest cost storage options, they, they, they uh, um, erroneously inflated the, the costs of phasing out gas power. And, and the third 
uh, misleading the assumption they made to exaggerate the cost of phasing out gas power is they assumed we would need to build a $3 billion new nuclear reactor to phase out gas power, despite the fact that we have much lower cost options to do so. So, so when you read the report carefully, there is absolutely no factual basis for their claim that a gas power phase out would raise electricity costs or rates. Uh, next slide, please. Now this slide shows the costs of uh, our, Ontario's various options uh, to keep our lights on. And the lowest cost options are on the left-hand side. And I want to draw your attention first to the bar graph in the middle with a cost of nine cents per kilowatt hour. That bar graph shows the fuel and carbon tax costs of continuing to operate our gas plants in 2030. So it's just the fuel and carbon tax costs. It doesn't include the capital costs, but, but those fuel and carbon tax costs uh, amount to nine cents a kilowatt hour. Now look at the bar graphs to the left, to the left of the nine cent per kilowatt hour bar graph. And you will see that energy efficiency, Quebec water power, solar power, and onshore wind can all meet our electricity needs at a significantly lower cost than continuing to operate the gas plants in 2030. So what does that tell you? Well, it tells us that by investing in energy efficiency and by investing in renewable power, not only can we phase out the gas-fired power plants by 2030, but we can also lower our electricity costs and lower our electricity rates. So while the IESO told us that a gas power phase out would raise rates, the truth is that if we phase out gas power by the lowest cost options, then we can lower rates. Now I'd like to turn your attention to the bar graph on the far right. That's the bar graph with a cost of 20 to 26 cents per kilowatt hour. Well, that's the cost of getting power from a new gas-fired power plant. And this is what the Doug Ford government wants to do. It also wants to build new gas-fired power plants at a cost of 20 to 26 cents per kilowatt hour. Well, this is just absolutely nuts because as you can see in this, uh, this chart, we've got uh, energy efficiency and renewables can keep our lights on at just a fraction of the cost of building a new uh, gas-fired power plant. Next, I'd like to turn your attention to the yellow bar graph in the middle with a cost of 10.5 cents a kilowatt hour. That's the price we're paying today for nuclear uh, electricity. If you, if you move to the right and look at the yellow bar graph with a cost of 13.7 cents a kilowatt hour, that's the price we'll be paying for nuclear electricity in 2027 if Ontario power generation completes the rebuilding of all four of Darlington's nuclear reactors. And if you look at the bar graph, the yellow bar graph with a cost of 16.3 cents a kilowatt hour, that's the cost of, of, of getting electricity from a new nuclear reactor. So once again, you can see that energy efficiency and renewables can keep our lights on at a much lower cost than the nuclear power. So what so so here are the messages. By investing in energy efficiency and renewables, we can phase out gas power by 2030 and lower our electricity rates. And if we do even more energy efficiency and renewables than are necessary to phase out just the gas plants, we can start to reduce our dependency on high cost uh, uh, nuclear power and uh, achieve further electricity bill reductions for Ontario's electricity consumers. So in short, what this shows is that Doug Ford's um, energy policies are not only climate lunacy, they're economic lunacy because Doug Ford's policies are increasing our greenhouse gas pollution and increasing our electricity rates. And, and that makes absolutely no sense when by investing 
when we could invest in energy efficiency and renewables to actually reduce our greenhouse gas pollution and to reduce our electricity rates and costs. Next slide, please. And so in this context, uh, it's very interesting to note that in September, the ISO released their Dunsky report. And the Dunsky report, which was done for the ISO, and it's a two volume report, uh, lots of analysis. The Dunsky report confirms what the Ontario Clean Air Alliance has been saying for years. And the Dunsky report says, we do not need new gas plants to keep our lights on. And the Dunsky report says, if, in, if we invest in energy efficiency and solar power and energy storage instead of new gas plants, well, then we can reduce our electricity costs by up to $290 billion. So that's the good news story. Uh, what the Clean Air Alliance says has been confirmed by a report that was done for the independent electricity system operator and released in September of, of this year. Next slide, please. So uh, as I just mentioned, the Dunsky report was released in September. Well, one, one week later, Ontario's energy minister, Todd Smith, directed the ISO to contract for up to 1,500 megawatts of new gas-fired generation capacity. That's the equivalent of three large gas-fired power plants. And this doesn't, just doesn't make any sense. It means higher greenhouse gas pollution, and it means higher electricity rates for Ontario's electricity consumers. It's just insane. Next slide, please. So now I want to, to outline to you uh, the Clean Air Alliance's six-point plan uh, uh, to, to phase out gas-fired power by 2030 and, and lower our electricity rates. But the th first three points of our plan are focused on how we can return the gas plant's pollution back to their 2017 level as soon as possible. Well, the first thing we should do is ban gas-fired electricity exports to the U.S. If we did that, we could get a big reduction in gas pollution overnight. This can be done instantaneously. The second thing we should do is double our spot market purchases of low cost Quebec water power. Now we are buying power from Quebec now, but we're not with our existing transmission lines, but we're not using those transmission lines to their full capacity. So with the existing transmission lines, we could double our spot market purchases of Quebec water power tomorrow and get another instantaneous, immediate, uh, significant reduction in our gas-fired uh, power generation. And the third thing that we should be doing is we should be purchasing all the energy efficiency savings and all the solar and wind power that, we, that can keep our lights on at less than the cost that we're paying for nuclear electricity today. And if we do that, we'll, we'll get a lot of energy efficiency, we'll get a lot of wind and solar power, and we'll also uh, lower our electricity costs. Next slide, please. But to achieve a complete gas power phase out by 2030, we also need to phase out gas on our hottest summer days when our air conditioners are running full out and our coldest winter nights. And to do that, we've also got to expand our transmission links with, with Hydro-Quebec so we can import more water power on those peak demand days. And second, we need to install bi-directional charges for our electric vehicles. Now at the moment, all, virtually all the electric vehicle chargers in Ontario are unidirectional. That is, they allow the electricity grid to power our electric vehicles, but they don't allow our electric vehicles to send power back to the grid during peak demand hours to help phase out the gas plants. So it's really important that we start um, installing bi-directional chargers. And for example, the government of Canada is, is, giving, is spending a lot of money on, on, on EV chargers but they're not bi-directional. And that's a huge missed opportunity because by 2030, 
the capacity of our EV batteries will be more than twice the capacity of all of our gas-fired power plants. So EV batteries can play a huge role in helping to phase out uh, uh, the, the ga gas power. Next slide, please. And finally, we must OPG, Ontario Power Generation, which we own, has five large gas-fired power plants, and they should be put on standby reserve between 2030 and 2040 so that they can provide emergency backup power to our grid if for any reason, because of an extreme event, we, we don't have enough uh, uh, zero carbon resources to keep our lights on. So if we put OPG's gas plants on standby reserve, then we can guarantee the people of Ontario and the businesses of Ontario that as we move to a zero carbon electricity grid, there will be absolutely no risk of blackouts. Next slide, please. So as I hope I've convinced you now, uh, we can uh, phase out gas power by 2030 and lower our electricity bills. It's the rational thing to do. Uh, but unfortunately, we have a Premier of Ontario who is a climate and economic lunatic. He's stuck in the 1950s. He loves fossil gas. He loves high cost uh, nuclear energy. A and he appears to hate energy efficiency and renewables. So if we're gonna actually make progress, we need the federal government to step in and to establish clean electricity regulations that will prohibit the building of new gas plants in Ontario and require Ontario to go to a zero carbon electricity grid by 2030. So the Clean Air Alliance and, and more than 30 other organizations like the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario and the Canadian Association of, of Physicians for the Environment, we wrote uh, to Prime Minister Trudeau and, and NDP leader Jag Jagmeet Singh and asked them to work together to establish these clean electricity regulations that, that would phase out uh, gas power in Ontario. Now you may ask, well, why did we write to um, the leader of the NDP too? Well, the, the reason is very simple. In March of this year, uh, the NDP and the Liberals signed an agreement. Uh, where the NDP promised to keep the Liberals in power until June 2025 if they implement a number of progressive uh, programs and, and policies. For example, establish dental care, uh, create affordable housing. But also one of their, one very key component of this deal was that Trudeau and, 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 and Singh promised to work together to dramatically reduce our greenhouse gas pollution by 2030. So we're asking the NDP and the Liberals to work together to fulfill their commitment to the, to the Canadians by, uh, to dramatically reduce our greenhouse gas pollution by phasing out a, a gas power in Ontario by 2030. Next slide, please. So we're, we'll, we need your help uh, to persuade the Prime Minister and to persuade the leader of the NDP uh, to, to, do, to do what we've asked them to do. So there's a number of ways you can help. You could send an email to the Prime Minister and to Mr. Singh, and there's the link of uh, where you can go to, to send an email to them. Second, you could ask your, your local community group uh, uh, to sign on to our, our letter to the Prime Minister and Mr. Singh. Third, you could distribute our climate lunacy pamphlet uh, to your friends and neighbors. And fourth, you could actually um, uh, schedule a meeting with your MP in his or her constituency office. And you could ask your MP to support um, our requests for clean el electricity regulations, which will phase out gas power in Ontario by 2030. And next slide, please. And so here's a, a picture of our climate lunacy uh, pamphlet. We've got lots of copies in our office and if you'd like to distribute them, we'll be glad to mail them out to you. Next slide, please. Now I want to uh, uh, turn to the second type of climate lunacy that, that Doug Ford is engaged in, namely the, the promotion of, 
more uh, more homes being hooked up uh, to gas for home heating. And and this plan, you know, makes absolutely no sense because by installing an air source heat pump instead of a new gas furnace, a homeowner can can experience a larger reduction in their their home heating bills and cannot actually reduce their greenhouse gas pollution. So for a uh, for a, a homeowner in an existing gas community like Toronto or Ottawa or Hamilton or Kitchener, um, you would save about $10,000 over the next 15 years if you install an air source heat pump instead of a new gas furnace. But if you live in one of these new gas communities where Enbridge is bringing gas to rural communities that don't currently have gas, well, your saving would be twice as great you'll save about $20,000. And that's because people who live in these new gas communities, their gas rates are significantly higher than the gas rates of existing uh, um, customers of Enbridge gas. And also, of course, um, if you install an air source heat pump, not only do you reduce your, your energy bills, but you reduce, reduce your greenhouse gas pollution. And with our existing electricity mix, when you switch from a gas furnace to a air source heat pump, you reduce your, your home heating um, greenhouse gas pollution by 35%. But the good news is that, you know, once we move Ontario to a zero carbon electricity grid, when you switch from a gas furnace to an air source heat pump, you're gonna be able to reduce your greenhouse gas pollution for, for home heating by 100%. So another reason why it's so important to clean up our electricity grid, create a zero carbon electricity grid for Ontario. Next slide, please. Now I told you that over the lifetime of your, your new equipment, air source heat pumps will give you bigger bill reductions. Nevertheless, many people are still installing gas furnaces because they've got a lower upfront capital cost. So, so here's what Doug Ford should be doing. He should be directing our electric utilities to provide no down payment, no interest loans for their customers who want to install cold climate air source heat pumps. If Doug Ford would do this, then everyone could experience uh, uh, immediately a reduction in their energy bills by installing, by installing an air source heat pump. So if, if Doug Ford really wants to make life more affordable for the average Ontario <coughs> homeowner, this is what he should be doing. And of course, it would also reduce our, our greenhouse gas pollution. Now, if you want to help us with this campaign, you know, please contact Doug Ford or your local MPP. And also, we've got a pamphlet um, to, warn, um, to, uh, to warn customers about uh, Enbridge's um, uh, a promotion of gas, and it's called "Don't Let Enbridge Take You for a Ride," and it tells you that you know explains how heat pumps are are a better deal for the homeowner. So again, we've got lots of copies of this this leaflet, and if you would like to help us distribute it to your friends or neighbors, uh, please let us know. So thank you very much for your attention, and if you have any questions, I'll be pleased to answer them. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Jack. Um, that was a good presentation. We we have quite a number of of people who who wish to ask questions and seek clarifications. I I, I would like, to, however, to be be the first to go and and uh, uh, make a comment. First off, being uh, anyone interested in knowing what's happening on the IESO, uh, they have an excellent website which is just full of material and the uh, access to it is ieso.ca I, I do recommend that anyone interested go and, and wander around in there there's a wealth of information in there <clears throat> as well as quite a number of reports which um, uh, can help shed some light on some of the things that jack has been saying <clears throat> the um, the other thing is, I'd just like to comment on 
uh, these low energy nuclear reactors, they, they typically run between uh, 30 megawatts and 300 megawatts. And <clears throat> there has been work going on in other parts of the world looking at virtual power plants that can produce the same amount of power as a small modular reactor, but, but to build it from renewable resources, wind energy and, and storage. Um, and Jack has, of course, talked to, to a little bit of that in terms of using EV uh, battery storage. But there's also uh, uh, quite a, a lot of home battery um, storage that is that exists, for example, in California, Hawaii, and, and elsewhere. And in fact, my microgrid has, has three of those as well. <clears throat> um, and that, that's just a, a, a comment, but you can think about these um, uh, virtual power plants. You can get the equivalent of a virtual power plant just through efficiency, just by not <laughs> drawing power from the grid. And of course, um, <clears throat> you uh, on the other side of the coin, you can be supplying power to the grid up to uh, uh, 30 megawatts and uh, through some, some uh, aggregator. Who, who can bring all that together. I, I wonder if you could just comment, Jack, on, on the concept of virtual power plants and if in fact the, the uh, IESO is showing any interest or, or in fact is the Ford government showing any interest in, in virtual power plants? Well, that's a good question, Art. And yes, like the virtual power plants, they're small scale, uh, decentralized options like energy efficiency or, or 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 wind or you know solar on your rooftop and yes those are are very low cost options and it's decentralized and it you know allows homeowners to be to be involved in in meeting our electricity needs and so this is absolutely the way of the future uh unfortunately uh the ISO and the Ford government is stuck in the 1950s and their preference is for these large scale centralized power plants. Like for example, the, the proposed new nuclear reactor in the GTA, which is 300 megawatts and, and the, the proposed new gas fired power plants that, that Doug Ford wants to build. So yes, what you're proposing is the way of the future. It's, it's where we should be going, but unfortunately it's not where we're going now in Ontario. And, you know, the Dunsky report, which I referred to and which was done for the IESO, I mean, their options were the type of options uh, you were, you're talking about. And they pointed out one of the reasons why we're not really tapping into those uh, uh, options to the full extent that they're cost effective is, is because of, uh, you know, the IESO um, refuses to pay fair market value for the services they provide. And the ISO also has a lot of red tape um, that discourages uh, small scale power producers from supplying power um, uh, to the grid. So yes, it's absolutely the way we should be going. And the Dunsky re report agrees with you. But again, uh, we need a, 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 a political direction uh, to, to get the ISO uh, moving in the right direction. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, David Pollitt to go next, and uh, that uh, Raymond Lurie, you're you're on deck. I know you've got uh, both questions and comments, and if you could bundle it in some way, that would uh, save me calling you up more than once. Go ahead, David. Sure, thank you. These were questions that arose just throughout the course of the presentation. I was curious about whether there's ever been work that you know of uh, the Ontario government trying to negotiate fixed price contracts when it comes to the building of a new facility, like a new nuclear facility. That was one. The other was, the other two were, I was wondering whether uh, the sources of uh, additional power, whether there's any problem contracting additional sources of Quebec or the other source you mentioned. And finally, I wondered what your reflection is about the kind of political fallout that might occur if Ontario announced we were ending U.S. exports of electricity. Uh, so those are questions that I absorbed during the course of the presentation, which I found excellent. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, thank you, David, for those good questions. Yes, so with nuclear power, 
the way that nuclear power projects have always been built in Ontario is the is the nuclear companies they they come to the government of Ontario they, and they lowball the cost estimates. They give a low a, a low cost estimate to persuade the to to trick the government into believing that nuclear power will be cost effective. I mean, way back in the 1950s, the nuclear industry promised that nuclear power would be too cheap to meter. But anyway, so in Ontario, whenever we've had uh, nuclear projects proposed and approved, uh, the nuclear industry uh, lowballed the cost estimate, and then they had huge cost overruns, which were always passed on to the Ontario electricity consumer. Now, when the Liberals were in power, they were considering building uh, two new, new large nuclear reactors at Darlington. And the energy minister at the time, George Smitherman said, okay, I'm not gonna allow you to trick me again by, by lowballing your cost estimates and then passing the cost overruns onto consumers. So he said to the companies that, that wished to build these new nuclear reactors at Darlington, he said, you've got to give me a fixed uh, uh, price uh, contract. And, and if there is, uh, if there are cost overruns, uh, 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 you have to eat them. The cost can't be pa passed on to Ontario's electricity consumers. So that forced the, 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 uh, the nuclear companies to provide honest bids. And the bid came in at $26 billion. And when George Smitherman and Premier McGinty opened up those bids, they had sticker shock and they said, no, thank you. And, but now, you know, we've got this new proposal from Doug Ford for a new nuclear reactor in the GTA. And, and that will be done by Ontario Power Generation, which is owned by, by you and me. And there is, you know, absolutely no uh, proper cost assessment. Uh, typically, um, Ontario Power Generation's rates are approved by the Ontario Energy Board. They have public hearings. They do a review to determine whether or not OPG's rates are, are just and reasonable. But with respect to this new nuclear reactor for the GTA, Doug Ford has sent a directive to the Ontario Energy Board. You can't rev review the economics or the financial prudence of this proposed new nuclear reactor. You can't, you can't review it. It's, it's beyond your scope. Whatever the costs are, um, OPG is going to be allowed to recover them. So totally financially irresponsible, uh, but but that's the, the way it is. Uh, the, the nuclear lobby is very politically powerful. With respect to um, Quebec water power, uh, I think the question was, you know, could could would Quebec be willing to sell us more power? Absolutely. Uh, the Premier of Quebec, uh, 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 Premier Legault, met Doug Ford uh, soon after Doug Ford was first elected in 2018 and begged him to buy more Quebec water power. Doug Ford said no. Doug Ford is an electricity separatist. Uh, the only, we bought spot market purchases from Hydro-Quebec for years, but the only uh, long-term contract that's, that, that we've had with Hydro-Quebec was an agreement that was signed by uh, Premier Kathleen Wynne in 2016. That was a seven year deal. It was a good deal. The only problem was it was too small. Uh, and then, uh, you know, when, when Kathleen Wynne was still Premier of, of Ontario, Hydro Quebec came back to her again and said, Hey, we'd like to sell you more power. 20 years, fixed price, only five cents a kilowatt hour. And Kathleen Wynne said no. And that was a huge mistake by Kathleen Wynne. So the reason why we don't buy more Quebec power is because Ontario premiers are electricity separatists. Uh, they're not doing what's best for consumers and the environment, but they're protecting the interests of our large Ontario electric utilities like Ontario Power Generation and, and, and Bruce Power. A and with respect to uh, banning gas-fired electricity exports to the US, Absolutely, we can do that if it's part of a of a of a plan to phase out uh, uh, gas-fired electricity generation in Ontario too. Uh, as long as it, it's it's 
as long as we do it even handedly. And that's what we're advocating. We're advocating um, to never fire up the gas fired power plants unless they're absolutely necessary to keep the lights on in Ontario. And as part of that, we wouldn't export gas fired electricity to the, to the US unless for some reason it's needed on an emergency basis to keep the lights on in, in New York State or, or Michigan. Jack, thanks very much. The, the one question I didn't um, come back to that I typed in was the source that you were using for all of your prices and price projections. Um, is that a source that the Ontario government has validated or what is your source for those prices? Well, yes, yeah, so that's from a fact sheet, which you can go to our website and you click on the publication section and you scroll down to the fact sheet about Ontario's electricity cost options. Uh, the first page shows you all those nice bar graphs. Page two shows you all the references and, and the numbers for the cost of energy efficiency and the numbers for the cost of nuclear power. Those are all from uh, Government of Ontario documents, the IESO or Ontario Power Generation filings with the Ontario Energy Board. And with respect to, and the Quebec water power numbers are from the Hydro-Quebec's annual report. And the costs for, for wind and solar, they're from Lazard, which is a very reputable uh, private bank. Uh, and, and they produce cost estimates for all new electricity technologies. And they're basically the Bible in the electricity industry for, for electricity cost estimates. So no, no, no person who's in the energy industry uh, disputes Lazard's numbers. Thanks, Jack. I'll be joining your lobby effort. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. Okay. Raymond uh, Lurie, uh, you're next. You have, have uh, a number of comments and questions, and if you could bundle it in some way. That would uh, be appreciated. And on deck, uh, we have Walter Nittle. Go ahead, Raymond. Hi, Jack. Uh, thanks. Uh, hi, Jack. Thanks a lot for uh, for the presentation. It was uh, was really good. Uh, I've been following uh, your 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 efforts over the last few years. A uh, couple of things. The first one was a question about the uh, the price, which I think you you already answered. The price of the electricity uh, is estimated to be sixteen uh, cents a kilowatt hour with the uh, the new reactor that they're proposing. But obviously, if the price of that um, of that reactor, which is a new technology that's never been built before, is much higher than than what they're estimating. Then uh, the the price of electricity would uh, would uh, be proportional to the capital investment, uh, the extra investment that would be required, because most of the cost for nuclear is in the capital uh, bucket, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. So the other question I had is, uh, I don't know if you've probably seen that Enbridge has started a publicity campaign. Um, they're they're talking about how natural gas is such a great solution for the environment and how uh, compressed natural gas buses uh, in Hamilton are actually carbon negative, uh, which which uh, which is impossible. But anyways, uh, it, are you involved in any efforts to counter uh, that uh, publicity and maybe actually? A complaint to the um, to whomever uh, would be overseeing um, the ad space or the media space uh, to complain that it's false publicity and and trying to trying to stop that um, nonsense from being um, spread over the um, the media waves. Well, yeah, that's a very good suggestion. And in the past, for example, when Ontario Power Generation had misleading ads when they claimed that their, their coal-fired power plants were, were clean. Um, we, we complained to the Competition Bureau and we got the Competition Bureau to rule against them and, and require them to withdraw the ads and, and promise never to uh, produce misleading ads again. Uh, and so we were successful and that's, that's something that people can, can do. Uh, the problem is it's quite a process and you know, we had to have uh, lawyers to do that for us. And, you know, Ontario Clean Air Alliance, we're a small organization, we can't do everything, but, but that is a good suggestion. And certainly if anyone else on the call wants to, to jump in and do it, uh, you know, that would be great. <laughs> and in terms of, 
you said buses. I don't know whether you said school buses or just buses in general. No, it's actually Hamilton transit buses. In the ads, right. they show Hamilton transit buses are com compressed natural gas. Mm -hmm. And there's a big thing, actually, maybe the city of Hamilton is one place where we should be uh, complaining uh, because it's on their transit buses and it's it's misleading, right? Well, well absolutely. Uh, Hamilton should be encouraged to, uh, uh, you know, invest in, in pure electric buses. Uh, electric buses will be a much better solution. And for another thing that we're, you know, promoting are electric school buses, because electric school buses, you know, they're going to have big batteries. They only operate for, you know, a, a few hours of the day. And when they're, when they're back in their garages, if they have bi-directional chargers, then they can provide power back back to the grid on cold winter nights after the school school kids are back in their homes and to help keep the lights on in in Ontario's homes during the winter. So, and actually and actually in the summer when the, when those buses are hardly used they could be used to soak up excess solar during the day and then uh, power it back to the grid uh, in the evening when we have the peak right so yeah those are, are really interesting solutions. Uh, I did a presentation a, a, a few months ago on vehicle to grid and uh and uh you, you, it was with kcor so if you're interested you might want to look at that uh, because I, I you know vehicle to grid is a great solution uh, to store excess uh, green energy yeah absolutely We're, we really like that option and we need to work together to uh to persuade the federal and provincial government to provide the funding for bi-directional chargers it's a huge mm -hmm. missed opportunity all these charges are going in now they're unidirectional and it's a waste it's a wasted opportunity okay excellent um raymond i know uh, you you would put uh, comments in uh, a number of places if you want to get back in the queue you're going to have to uh, put put in another request please okay walter Nettle, you're you're on now we have um uh Derek Paul on deck go ahead walter Okay, great. Uh, excellent presentation. I really enjoyed it. Very uh, insightful. Um, I agree with the emphasis on hydro. However, I'm just wondering if uh, in the future it'll be stable enough because you know climate change is already forcing drying up some rivers and lakes, like you know Lake Mead and uh, several rivers in Europe this year. So I'm just wondering if it might not be as stable as it used to be in the future. Well, well, that's a good point, and I'm an economist, not a not a climate scientist, but I believe that most of the climate uh, models predict, uh, like like for Quebec, for example, increased precipitation. So I think, if anything, maybe it's more likely that that Hydro Quebec will have more water power in the future. But but again, I'm not a climate scientist, but and 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 yes, we we shouldn't just be investing in water power. Uh, in fact, we're not advocating building new water power facilities because Ontario and Quebec have, have tapped out all of their low cost water power facilities already. And so in terms of new supply, the, the lowest cost sources of new supply are solar and wind. They're much, much lower cost than building a new, a new water power facility. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you. And um, Derek, uh, would you go ahead? We have uh, Peter Volkowski is on deck. Can, have you, can you hear me? Go yes. Ahead. Good. Um, I just wanted to point out that you, you mentioned um, th that there's, um, there are some uh, uh, climate change deniers still around. Uh, and I think the approach uh, to climate change denial has, is very tardy, <laughs> but there's, there's an approach to that which overcomes, oh, it's a matter of opinion. It isn't a matter of opinion. The menace of climate change isn't just the warmer temperatures. Uh, the, the biggest menace is the death of the ocean and the production of vast quantities of hydrogen sulfide uh, from the ocean, which uh, are capable of killing 90% or 95% uh, of everything that's alive. Uh, these come from the facts which are undeniable, which even the climate change deniers don't deny, and that is the larger quantity of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, 
and that diffuses into the ocean and makes it less acid. The ocean isn't very far from turning the turning point now where it ceases to be alkaline and starts to be acid. And very soon after that, the death processes begin. So we don't know how long after that that information is not available. But that is the, the total contradiction of uh, the idea that um, letting more carbon dioxide out isn't dangerous. It's absolutely suicidal. And, um, and it's easily demonstrated uh, the, on the, the way I just explained. Thank you. Good point. Thanks, Derek. <laughs> Did you want to uh, comment uh, further on that or just accept that as a comment? No, I accept what Derek says. <laughs> All right. Okay, so let, let's uh, move on to uh, Peter Balkowski and we have um, Don Cameron on deck. Jack, you gave a uh, cost for power from uh, Quebec. Uh, is that cost based on uh, continuous uh, supply of power? Uh, what would Quebec actually charge if we were doing peaking power, which is one of the reasons why some of those natural gas plants have very high costs because they're not operating most of the time. Uh, would Quebec indeed be willing to provide power uh, in whatever amounts Ontario needed uh, on short notice, basically minutes to, uh, basically minutes, uh, and then shut off the, the uh, routing of Quebec power? Well, thanks for that question. So in our bar graph, the, we showed the average Hydro-Quebec export price in it last year in 2021. And that was an average of their spot market uh, prices and their long-term contracts. And in terms of going forward for a new contract, it's, it'll be up to a negotiation between Ontario and Hydro-Quebec. And, but I would point out that the deals we've signed in the past have been very reasonable. The deal that was signed by uh, Premier Kathleen Wynne, uh, it was reviewed by the Financial Accountability Office and found to be a good deal for, for Ontario. And as I mentioned back in 2017, they offered us a 20 year supply at only uh, five cents a kilowatt hour. I would also point out to you that the city of Cornwall has a, a, obtained a 100% of their electricity from Hydro-Quebec for 50 years. And the city of Cornwall has the lowest electricity rates of any city in Ontario. So, so we can get, we historically have got very good deals from, from Quebec, mm -hmm. no reason to think we can't in the future. And the interesting thing about Quebec and Ontario is that the demand for electricity in Ontario peaks in the summer when our air conditioners are going full out. Whereas in Quebec, the demand for electricity peaks in the winter because they've got a lot of electrically heated homes. And so that means Quebec has to build their system to supply all of their needs in the winter. And in, in, and in the summer, Hydro-Quebec has an absolutely huge surplus of power. When it, on the hottest summer days when the, uh, on, Ontario's air conditioners are going full out and when we're, and when we in, Ontario are experiencing a peak demands. Hydro-Quebec has a surplus of 10,000 megawatts. And so Hydro-Quebec's surplus of 10,000 megawatts is greater than the total production of our gas-fired power plants on our hot summer days. And they got this huge surplus. And if we just had more transmission lines, you know, we could, we could import all that power. And and there's no reason to think that we couldn't get it at a, at a very good rate, a much, much lower cost than 20 to uh, 25 cents a, a kilowatt hour, which will be the cost from the, these new peaker plants. So, so Jack, what, what is your estimate for peaking power from Quebec? Not spot market. Spot market is totally different than peaking. So peaking energy. What would well, as again, as I said, it will be a negotiation between Ontario and Quebec. Uh, but, you know, the ISO does have a capacity auction where they buy, you know, capacity to meet our needs I I in the summer. And that's a competitive procurement process. And, and recently, you know, Hydro-Quebec has bid into that process and, and, and supplied power 
to the IESO at a competitive price, competitive with Ontario producers. Now, to the best of my knowledge, the ISO does not reveal the, the prices they pay uh, uh, to each individual supplier. I, I believe they just uh, provide the average price. Uh, but but that's something you could you know pursue with the ISO. How much they pay uh, Hydro Quebec for for capacity in the summer. But but what we do know is it's competitive with the other alternatives. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And the next is uh, Don Cameron and then uh, Richard Vanderjag, please. Okay, um, my question regards the uh, federal government prohibiting construction of new gas plants in Ontario, which was on one of your slides. And um, so can the federal government do this? Isn't uh, electricity a provincial jurisdiction? So under what authority would they be able to, to do that kind of prohibition? Well, as you may recall, I, in the last year or two, uh, the pr provincial governments like Doug Ford's government went to the Supreme Court of Canada to challenge uh, the federal government's carbon tax. And the Supreme Court ruled that the federal government can impose a carbon tax and can in order to, to regulate greenhouse gas pollution. So, so the federal government does have the authority to regulate the greenhouse gas pollution from the electric power plants. So in effect, electricity is both a provincial and, and a federal jurisdiction. And, and, the, and the government of Ontario, the, sorry, the government of Canada is now um, proposing to establish clean electricity regulations you can go, you know, you can Google Environment Canada, clean electricity regulations. So they are moving forward to establish clean electricity regulations to, to control the greenhouse gas pollution from our power plants. Our only concern is these proposed regulations aren't strict enough and will not prohibit the building of these new gas-fired peaker plants and will not require Ontario to, to phase out gas power by 2030. So with that last statement that you just made, is, I, mean, I would think that the Ford government would challenge that attempt in, in the courts. Do you, well, do you... well, certainly they might, but I mean, they, they made that similar challenge about the carbon tax and were unsuccessful. So I think they would be extremely unlikely to be successful uh, 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 this time. Well, that certainly would be a, a welcome development. Um, I just want to add two other things uh, that that you mentioned. Um, one was about virtual power plants, and um, IEO sponsored a, a virtual power plant project in uh, the York region, and uh, that was called the York Region Non Wires Alternative. Right, and and that was that is that uh, was successful. And it is operational, and it's operated by the Electra uh, local uh, distribution company. Right. So that's one thing. The other thing about Quebec Hydro is that you mentioned that all of the prime sites for hydro on river hydro dams are taken, and but um, I've learned from um, studies done by the Australian National University. Uh, looking at two reservoir off-river uh, pumped hydro sites that can produce substantial um, power um, or store substantial power. Um, and Quebec has a lot of class A uh, sites that could be put, that could be constructed. Um, the the uh, determination that this potential exists was done by a software program that uses GIS data. <laughs> and uh, so they don't have detailed uh, engineering studies to back this up, but they, they say that there's potential um, because of uh, the determination that you've got two uh, sites that have got, there's enough um, uh, height difference between the two of them and are close enough that it would be economically feasible to to uh, develop them as pumped hydro sites. So I just wanted to throw that out there so that people are aware 
that there's a lot of uh, a, a tremendous amount of storage that could be developed in Quebec mm -hmm. using pump tiger. That's all. I'm done. Okay. Well, thanks, Don, Don, for that comment. And I'm sure you're correct that there is that potential for pump storage in, in Quebec. But the problem with pump storage is you have to use electricity, quite a lot of electricity, to pump the water uphill into the storage reservoir. And in the case of Quebec, there's no need to, to, to invest in that high cost option because their existing reservoirs have a huge untapped storage potential that can be used and doesn't require any pumping. And there's a, there's a Massachusetts Institute of Technology called a Two Way Trade in Green Electrons, the role of Canadian hydropower. And it shows that Hydro Quebec's existing reservoirs, which are not pump storage, are the lowest cost uh, storage option for, for wind and solar. So mm -hmm. here's how it would work if we were smart in Ontario and we, and we would be willing to, to cooperate with Hydro Quebec. We will build wind power facilities. When the wind power production is above average, we would export the surplus wind power to Quebec. They would use that surplus wind power to keep the lights on in Montreal. And as a result, they would have more water stored in their reservoirs. And then when our wind power in Ontario is below average, Hydro-Quebec would use that extra water they have in their reservoirs to produce hydroelectricity for export back to Ontario. And so by integrating our wind and solar with Quebec's existing hydro reservoirs, we can convert intermittent wind and solar into a firm 24 seven source of baseload electricity for Ontario. Well, that's an excellent plan, I think. It, absolutely, it's being endorsed by the MI, MIT as the lowest cost storage option for, for jurisdictions who are lucky enough to be located next door to the province of Quebec. So that includes Ontario, it includes New Brunswick, and it includes a number of US states in the US Northeast. But you know, we've got a premier who refuses to pursue that option, despite the fact that Premier Legault is begging him to do it. And the president of Hydro-Quebec is begging him to do it. But, but, but again, we've got an economic lunatic running our electricity system. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jack. You're welcome, Don. I think you're- Good question. Sir. Jack, your feelings are quite clear. Richard, uh, you're, you're next, and uh, I would like to uh, invite Brian, who has been raising his hand, to okay. be on deck. Thank you, Jack. I, I appreciate uh, your presentation. I, I did miss part of it, and I'm, I apologize if what I'm about to ask is something you already covered. I have a working gas furnace and uh, air conditioner, but I am interested in the possibility of putting in a ground source or air source heat pump. I live in Ottawa. The question is, uh, would it be economically a better idea to put in a, a heat pump, you know, where I live? I mean, ba basically, given that we have working system already. And then the question is, which one's better, air source or ground source? Okay, well, those are good questions. Uh, in terms of getting the maximum uh, reduction in greenhouse gas pollution, uh, the ground source is the better option. But the downside of the ground source heat pump is it's a much higher upfront capital cost than the air source heat pump. Right. And now, and so we've done studies on air source heat pumps versus gas. And in the next few weeks, we hope to release a study on the economics of ground source, of ground source heat pumps versus gas too. Uh, so our, our report on air source heat pumps versus gas it definitely shows that when your gas furnace um, needs to be replaced, your financially best choice is to install the air source heat pump, a cold climate air source heat pump. But for for a person like but there is, but for a person like you that maybe your your gas furnace is relatively new, um, a, a lower cost option would be to do the hybrid option where you combine. Your, your gas furnace with a conventional heat pump. And the advantage of going with a conventional heat pump is it's got a much lower upfront capital cost. Um, the disadvantage is it won't 100% replace your gas, your gas consumption, but it might replace it by 50 to 90%. Right. 
So that's an option that you should look at too. And on our website, we've got a, a primer about, about heat pumps and it, and it gives you links to you know, our reports. But also in term of, terms of the hybrid option, uh, the Toronto Region Conservation Authority has a number of reports about case studies of people who've done the hybrid option and who've got like a 50 to 90% reduction in their gas consumption. And again, at a much lower upfront capital cost. So I would suggest you also look at the, the Toronto Region Conservation Authority's website. And I think that will help you uh, figure out which way you want to go. I mean, it depends how much uh, money you're willing to, to spend right now. Okay, great. Well, thank you. You're welcome. All right, uh, thank you very much. And uh, we'll, we'll go now to uh, Brian. And uh, uh, we have Peter Ottenheiser on, on deck. Thank, thank you, Art. Um, before I get to my question, just a comment to verify the discussion we've just had about um, air source heat pumps. I, in my house, had a 14-year-old natural gas furnace um, and a high efficiency air conditioner. Um, I decided to go for the cold weather heat pump. I took out my furnace um, because it was at 14 years, it was getting towards the end of its natural lifetime. And we have just now switched to a uh, high efficiency air source heat pump and um, are enjoying it very much. And we were able to do this um, in without panicking, let me put it that way. When, when your gas furnace dies, uh, particularly in the middle of the winter, you may not have the time or the supply chain uh, to enable you to do a quick transition to an air source or certainly a ground source heat pump. So uh, a little bit of advanced planning makes it go smoothly and uh, we are extremely happy with that decision. It was costly, but I was able to uh, take advantage of both the federal greener homes program and a supplementary one here in Durham region. Um, to my question to Jack, and he probably won't be surprised by this, but the story that you tell of IESO's research on one hand and their public statements leads me to conclude that there is a huge politicization of what's supposed to be an independent um, research and planning agency in, in the form of IESO. Um, are, are we seeing this politicization to the point where they are willing to lie to the public about the results of their research? And to what do we attribute that? Does, does Doug Ford have a willing accomplice in the, in the form of Joe Oliver? Well, well, absolutely, Brian. Uh, like most of the reports that the ISO does are very high quality, like the Dunsky report, which yeah. shows that we could have no need for new gas-fired power plants and, and energy efficiency and renewables are much lower cost. But, you know, unfortunately, the ISO, it, they report to, they're a, a provincial agency, Doug Ford's their boss, and when you know, Doug Ford asks for a report to justify his energy policies, then they will produce the report that the, tells Doug Ford what he wants to hear to help him in his political battles. So, I mean, that's the reality. It, it's very sad. The, the ISO has independent in his name, independent electricity system operator, but it's not independent. It's very political. And, 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 you know, you expect civil servants to give factual, uh, unbiased, nonpartisan advice, but they don't do that. When Doug Ford wants a, a report to, to justify a, 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 a polluting gas or, or, or high cost nuclear, the ISO will produce a report to, to tell him what he wants to hear that, that he can use in his political battles. Yeah. And I mean, just as an add-on to that, the, the shameless use of the threat of blackouts just boggled me. I mean, we've seen this repeatedly over the last 50 years in Ontario. When you want to do something in the electricity sector as a politician, you, you threaten that there will be blackouts if you don't have your way. And, you know, 
here we have IESO doing that on Doug Ford's behalf. I just find it absolutely shameful. Well, yes, but you know, as you mentioned, we have a long tradition in Ontario of our, our electric utilities or our electric agencies um, uh, pulling the blackout card whenever they get scared, they may be losing a battle. Okay, yep. thank, thank you very much. It seems like uh, Peter has, has left us. So next up is uh, Ted Manning. And uh, we, we have a number of comments as well from um, Neil Alexander, who will be on deck. Ted, go ahead. Hi there. Yeah, I was just going to look at the idea of comparative risk management and really how people are reacting to lack of knowledge or perceived knowledge that they don't have. Uh, as is very clear, the reactions to nuclear have an awful lot to do with emotion and ignorance. Uh, and even, uh, and certainly the more modern nuclear, the small nuclear and so on have immense possible potential. There's also a question of, of simply a politician owning it and the idea that we can own our own piles of coal, make big bucks, pay people to earn money making it, and it's all ours, of course, I think is behind the reluctance of people to rely on other uh, provinces. Uh, it is obviously better for the province of Ontario as it gets out of, it has got the, out of most of the really rough stuff. Uh, to rely on other jurisdictions uh, and to obviously spread its dependence across a range of different technologies. And certainly for the next couple of decades, I think electricity taken from other places, not just Quebec, Manitoba has a massive capacity to produce more and sell it too. Uh, really, we are dealing with a great deal of lack of holistic look at risk and at how you manage it. And of course, you don't, a point I made in, in my comment is you normally don't try and put something dangerous or perceived as dangerous right next to your most precious resources. So I'm, I realize that perhaps the best political place to put the new nuclear reactor is right under Queen's Park. Uh, but by and large, uh, I would recommend, uh, given modern technology, the ability to transport uh, power largely lossless for very long distances at ambient temperature. There are some pretty good sites uh, if you want to do nuclear do it on the source of the resource so you don't have to frighten people bringing uranium through their uh, through their communities or putting stuff back and uh, doing long distance transmission because the Chinese are successfully transmitting uh, largely lossless solar power from the Gobi all the way to Beijing with almost no loss at the end. So yes, there are solutions. And I think, uh, so my comment is, have we enough logic to allow us to actually realistically consider the other alternatives. Well, you're very right. I, I think most of the electricity decisions in, in Ontario are made by the Premier of Ontario, whoever he is. And, and Premiers of Ontario are rarely very well informed on electricity issues. And they're very, uh, so they're typically very heavily influenced by special interest lobbies. And so I think as a result, we've made a lot of uh, bad decisions in Ontario. And as an economist, we certainly haven't focused, I can say we certainly haven't focused on, on the lowest cost options yeah. uh, or the lowest risk options. Yeah. I mean, to me as an economist, it makes absolutely no sense that I mean, it seems to me our priority should be on energy efficiency and wind and solar electricity and in Quebec water power. Uh, they're the lowest cost option financially and they're, they're definitely the lowest risk option. Uh, but that's not what we're focusing on. We're focusing on polluting gas and very high cost in nuclear power. And that doesn't make any sense to me. But, you know, as you point out, uh, uh, decisions making isn't made on, on the basis of all the facts and, and a careful analysis. No, if you actually have a brain, the likelihood is not you're going into politics. He says cynically. <laughs> okay, th th thank you for that. Um, right. we're, we're getting close to the end and uh, 
we have had a number of, of comments that have come in from um, Neil Alexander. So I ask that you try and bundle these in some way uh, such that we can uh, try and address the lot within the next five minutes. Go ahead. Neil? Did he disappear on me? <clears throat> All right. Uh, he seems to have gone. Derek Paul, can you can you go ahead and uh, ask your, your your final question? Um, I I just wanted to to put um, into the discussion we just heard about costs, uh, um, relative costs, and especially nuclear, that um, the nuclear has always been considered by certain scientists to have a, a row of a uh, selection of disadvantages. And one of them we've heard about already today, the fact that uh, people lowball the estimates. Um, but there's, there's another one which, um, which is due to Helmut, the late Hel Helmut Burkhardt, who was a, a Ryerson professor of energy. And he, uh, he made the suggestion that among the objections to nuclear energy as it is today, he said that nuclear reactors should all be buried uh, if they're going to be constructed, they should be uh, beneath or beside large walls of impenetrable earth uh, because of the dangers of action by terrorists or by war. And we've seen this recently for the first time, I think, in um, the Ukraine, that, that a, major, um, um, a major station producing um, electric power by nuclear uh, has been attacked. And this is perhaps the first instance. And I think it brings um, uh, Helmut Burkhardt's uh, um, proposal, namely that all reactors should be built in such a way that they're protected against that kind of thing. Uh, this, of course, would add considerably to the expense. And I just want to put this in that it's another way in which nuclear power is underestimated in price. And I'd like very much like Jack's comments. Well, Derek, I don't, I don't think I ever disagree with you. That's another good point. <laughs> um, Hi there, you... everyone. It's, it's Neil Alexander here. Can you hear me now? Yeah, go ahead, Neil. Yeah, I, um, I'm, I apologize for that. I don't know why that wasn't working, but I rebooted a few things and it's come on. Um, I think, you know, I, I was throwing in some comments there to try and create some balance and make some observations. Electricity systems are, are very um, complex. And um, one of the things that we need to remember is that governments can never allow electricity not to be supplied. The consequences to human health and to the economy are so great that they have to be able to guarantee it and they can't gamble with it. And a lot of the discussion today is a gambling discussion in which we say, well, it ought to be possible. Ought to be possible isn't good enough. And, and in some of the discourse with Angela, she said, well, 99% of the time it would be fine. 99% of the fine time is not good enough. Electricity is needed 100% of the time. So that's the challenge. But I'd like to perhaps end on a note where, where I actually agree with the presentation. And that is that, ideological approaches to dealing with electricity systems have done more to harm progress than anything else. And that we have to keep an open mind and we have to keep our eye on the prize, which is getting our greenhouse gas emissions down. And we need to, to focus on that rather than on the technology we want to push, because that is the way we are going to get a successful outcome. Well, well, thanks, Neil, for those comments. And as a Toronto Hydro, former Toronto Hydro Commissioner, I can assure you that I agree with you 100% that reliability is absolutely essential. Uh, I also agree that the, the goal is to reduce greenhouse gas pollution. And I think if we're going to achieve our very aggressive greenhouse gas uh, pollution reduction targets in a way that is affordable, we've got to focus on, on the lowest cost options. And, and, and that is energy efficiency and renewables. And in terms of technologies, we have to talk about them. We have to 
you know, assess their reliability and the risk of the different technologies. I believe that, uh, you know, energy efficiency and, and, and water power, uh, wind and solar power are, are very reliable when, when, when combined in an integrated solution. Whereas, you know, nuclear power with large centralized power plants can be very unreliable. For example, I will remind you. Sorry, can I finish speaking, Neil? Uh, I, I will remind people that in 1997, uh, the former Ontario Hydro unexpectedly uh, shut down seven nuclear reactors in Ontario for safety reasons. All of those reactors were shut down for at least five years. Two of those reactors are still shut down. And as a result, we had to crank up the output of our dirty coal-fired power plants by more than 120% to keep our lights on. So in, I don't think that, that nuclear power is, is a, a reliable option. It's got a bad track record. So I, I think you started well there and then demonstrated my point about ideology getting in the way of actually finding the right solution. Well, I thought I responded with facts, but Okay. Never. Gentlemen, no, you, you actually you actually said it was your opinion at one point, just to confirm that it was your opinion. And much of it is not borne out by the evidence, as you will well know from the situation that Germany finds itself in, having deployed plans very much in line with what you would have hoped for them. Sir, I'm I'm focusing on what's best for Ontario. I'm not giving advice to Germany and I'm not defending German policies. I, I'm here to talk about what is the best solution for Ontario, and I'm not going to claim that every government in the world has always made perfect decisions. Okay, gentlemen, we've reached the end of our time, and at this stage, I would like to uh, ask Jean Doherty to, to uh, thank you, Jack. Jean, go ahead. Um, thank you, Art, and um, <clears throat> I would, uh, it's my pleasure and my privilege to have the opportunity to thank you on behalf of the Canadian Association for the Club of Rome for this absolutely fabulous presentation. Um, you have brought home some of the issues, both political and personal, that people are facing um, in trying to make decisions for themselves and for their, um, the areas in which they live. So it's very, it's been a very interesting um, discussion that has been had and you, you made an absolutely wonderful presentation that really highlighted some of the things that that we need to look at and face so thank you very much for that jack <clears throat> my pleasure um, and for those of you who are not familiar with um kcor or canadian association for the club of rome we're a small nonprofit organization and you are more than welcome to come and look at our website canadiancore.com and if you go there and sign up for the stay informed section, you will actually be given um, access to the, the um, YouTube link for this particular presentation and all of the previous presentations that we have had as um, Art alluded, there were 125 of them, I think you said, or 121 um, presentations that we have had since the beginning of the pandemic and we have worked on the Zoom presentation series. So it's really well worth looking at. There are some wonderful presentations there for you to see. I would also strongly encourage people to join our organization. Um, we are, as I said, a very small organization and very um, trying to punch above our weight, as it were, to try and make people aware of the issues that we need to do to be, to be more, um, to, to go into the future. So I would uh, strongly encourage you to look at the possibility of becoming a member of, of CORE, of Canadian CORE, and um, look at our website for that information as well. So again, Jack, thank you very much for this presentation that you gave us today, and I look forward to some open discussion. Thank you.